Uh, so, as I was saying, thank you for coming out because I think the Friday before the start of school seems like the worst time ever to, to have a teaching conference. But over the years, when I thought about it, when is a better time? There isn't any. So, um, I think it's, it's great that we come here and get refreshed and hopefully go on to have a great semester. This, um, this session came out of, as we'll see in a minute, um, it came out of a uh, discussion on the part of the core. I think probably I recognize a lot of your faces, so a lot of you are, have already been drinking the Kool-Aid for a while, and the, the core is based on inquiry-based learning, or at least in theory, and we're going to talk about some of the uh, research behind inquiry-based learning today, and we're also going to look at some of the ways people implement it. But I also want to talk a lot about the difficulties, because I have to be honest with you, uh, a lot of times I come to Ann Farron and I go off and I, I implement great things that people say are awesome and they fall really flat in my classroom. Probably me, but um, I think sometimes you know things sound really good on paper are a lot harder to do in practice. And I have certainly found this in um, transforming my courses slowly uh, to meet what I think are the needs of students of the 21st century. Uh, but the research that I've done recently is also extremely clear. If you don't do this well, you might as well not do it. So it, it really is, I came away from the research with a, oh my goodness, um, you know, feeling of this is the start of a conversation, but we need a lot more conversations around inquiry-based learning. We're all going to do it, and we're all going to do it successfully. So in part, this session is a plea to get you guys interested and excited about it, but at the same time, um, it's not pie in the sky, and this, this can be difficult, and uh, we'll talk about those challenges in a minute. Uh, I always want to start a presentation with something a little bit more interesting than me, so um, I found this that is in part a handout to Cindy, for a reason that you'll see in a minute, uh, but I think it's also interesting. So we're just going to have a little bit of get excited about inquiry-based learning on a little YouTube video, which I have to say I never use in class, but, you know. All right, hopefully we'll have sound. There's no sound. See, it was going to be really fun. Good 
this is where I generally in my classroom when this happens, I call A B. Yeah. Yeah. First I ask the students sure. because often they can fix my problem. <laughs> <laughs> then I get on the phone. So to be embarrassed and honest, I'm the A B for at School of Communication. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the director of technology for the School of Communication. Um, I apologize. Our our theater manager is in Bali on a honeymoon. Uh, oh, nice. Well deserved, but uh, as a result, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm goofing it, and I didn't mean to do that. You're not suggesting we go to our honeymoon now, too, do you? Yeah, we can <laughs> go to Bali. But, so yeah. I guess my question to you is, should I wait for this, or should we just move on? Uh, so what we're trying to do is, if we're, uh, we think that the back computer here works, definitely has the audio, um, and while my, apparently it's 9.30 at night in Bali, so he's actually responding to my texts. So I'm sure it's, it's, it's more than it's very exciting. Right. <laughs> 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 Let's move on. We'll give you one, one, one moment, and then we can move on, because really it was just a nice breaker. Um, it was just a cute nice breaker. We just won't find it on our phones and watch it. Yeah, that's true. Right now, just Google it on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, all right, so let's do that. Good problem solving, guys. So take out your phone if you wish to. It, it just go to YouTube, inquiry based learning. It is literally the first thing that pops up. Which doesn't mean I'm lazy, it just means I really like it. Yeah, you only need to watch the Harry Potter part. The rest will tell you about it. Did you hear that or no? Okay. In the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth of the Harry Potter series, the Lord's language turns over and has been a In the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth of the Harry Potter series, Dolores Umbridge takes over as the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher and instantly transforms the classroom into this textbook-based, standardized, test-focused classroom. And Harry questions whether this will prepare them for fighting against Voldemort, uh, uh, he who must not be named, and that's when Umbridge punishes him. And he ends up forming his own school within a school called Dumbledore's Army. Now, Dumbledore's Army is purely inquiry based. While Harry is the teacher, he is mostly the guide on side, empowering students to ask questions and find the answers themselves. They rely on each other and on various spell books to solve problems and answer their questions. It is a space of experimentation. And while the process might seem messy compared to Umbridge's standardized approach, the students learn at a rapid pace because they aren't wasting their time repeating what they already know. This is an example of inquiry-based learning, although since it takes place in the UK, it's probably inquiry-based learning. <laughs> inquiry-based learning has existed for thousands of years. Well, Socrates. Okay. I, there was a lot of uh, kerfuffle for that very short period of time, but <laughs> I, I like it because uh, it's Harry Potter, uh, but also because it really makes it clear. Uh, yeah, I think that we want we don't want to be Umbridge, we want to be Harry, right? And for sorry, I'm Matt person, so I don't. Know. Why am I close to that? Awesome. I hope the rest of the work. 
come back over here. Uh, my goal for the session is to, or our goal for the session is to give you some of the latest research on inquiry based learning, give you a couple of examples of what it looks like in various fields. Uh, but it is huge, this topic, so uh, I would love to spend as much time as we possibly can, although the time is short now, uh, hearing from you what you have tried. And we're particularly interested in the things that have worked, but also the things that didn't work, because I think being empowered to try this is that uh, means knowing what's ahead of you. And uh, for me, sometimes ignorance is bliss, but in this case, uh, the stakes are high. Uh, we're all term faculty on this on this panel, and there are lots of us out there who uh, feel vulnerable to uh, student evaluations in particular. And so, being uh, adventurous in the classroom can sometimes feel really scary. Uh, I like the fact that we now have the ability to choose a course that we're going to not be evaluated on. That is really uh, key, but. If we're going to do this well, we have to do it in all of our courses, right? Not just one. So uh, we're going to start with the research, what it, what inquiry-based learning does, and why it's important, and then uh, come back to examples. Sorry. Yeah, it works. Okay, so I started by saying that the uh, inquiry-based learning is at the heart of the AU core, right? And we sat around for years now and talked about. What does education, particularly general education, look like for the 21st century? Uh, it's not. It, I realized that it wasn't me, right? I'm a historian. I, I learned how to stand up there, tell you everything I know about the fall of the Roman Empire, and then leave, right? This is that's the way I learned how to teach. Now I would have discussions every third or fourth lecture where the students participate and they read and, and we have good conversations. But the rest of the time, I really was just a talking head, and I'm not. I'm not saying that's terrible, and I still do it, and there's a place for lecture, absolutely, and nobody in the literature says we should jettison lecture completely, but that the research shows that the students take in what we say, and they bank it, and then they spit it back out like an ATM on a test, and then it goes away, right? So that's one of the reasons why I got excited about this, is you know, we say we're going to do something with our students, and I feel like if we say we're going to do it, we have to do it. So the core mission is, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I highlighted uh, the parts that I think are appropriate to, to our session, which is inquiry-based liberal arts education. We're telling parents that's what we're giving their kids, right? So we have to do that. And um, it goes on and uh, it offers, uh, one of the things that we'll talk about is the one of the great uh, exciting features of inquiry-based learning to me is that it gives great uh, attention to equity, diversity, and inclusion. The research is clear that students who are, uh, are uh, it provides a more equal education for students from a diverse um, set of backgrounds. So uh, why is it important? Uh, Bob will probably talk a little bit more about this, but um, higher education itself is more complex. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with my colleagues. And a lot of them said, it was fine for me when I was an undergrad. Why does it have to be different now? And uh, the research gave us a few ways of answering this. And one is that, and, and I understand the issues from the employer side, but I hadn't really thought about how um, education itself is more complex. Right? Uh, so there, there are more demands, as we know, because we read about it in the newspaper. They're placed on us by society. Um, I'm a medieval historian. I get this a lot. What in heaven's name does somebody need to study medieval history for? And I have a long list of reasons why, but um, still, it's hard sometimes to make the case. And in Britain, medieval history is under assault. They're trying to get rid of it completely. So um, all kinds of people have uh, an interest in the outcomes that we are delivering in ways that they didn't when you and I went to college, at least as undergrads. My parents didn't pay attention to what I was doing, let alone the government or uh, you know, anybody else. But employers, of course, also want students who can do things, right? They don't care if they know everything about the fall of the Roman Empire. They want them to be able to take the skills that I taught them in being a judicious use of, user of information or something like that and be able to adapt them to problems that need solving in the business arena. So why, why is this so necessary? Because apparently we're not doing it very well. Um, I don't know that we should read too much into a lot of the research of how poor a job we're doing, because I think overall we're doing okay. But 
um, this the, the, the Carnegie Foundation report from 1998 said that basically we're not delivering on the education that we promise our students because we are too stuck in uh, traditional modes of teaching. So they uh, identified the key missing piece is active learning. Right? It's students who go in and listen to a lecture and leave are passive learners. And passive learners cannot take that knowledge and do anything with it other than Jeopardy. Which I always tell my students is part of the reason why you're in college, so you can win a lot of money on Jeopardy. But you know, in terms of being an active learner, giving somebody a problem and having them solve it instead of telling them the end, right, the answer. Why did the Roman Empire fall? Well, I know the answer. Well, I know a couple of the reasons. And I usually tell them. But this year, I'm going to have them figure it out. And that's just many ways I've been thinking about this. But the research also shows that IBL supports the quality of education because it supports the personal development of the student. Right? So again, this is all student-centered. Right? We are now no longer going to be the um, most important person in the classroom, which breaks my heart. But I didn't like that. Um, and it is also a useful way of linking research to teaching, which universities talk about all the time, but frankly, we have trouble implementing. Uh, so, um, he found a lot of evidence that supported why intelligence learning is worth doing and why we want to, why the AU4 has been designed around um, with this sort of point in mind. So, um, what are the benefits? The, uh, the students will retain more information, which um, any of you have ever taught the course. Two semester course, you learn the second semester, two <coughs> learn in the first semester, maybe, maybe not. Um, it will provide basically other skills that they need beyond just the information um, that you or the facts that you have provided them with. So, um, allow them to self regulate and maybe have better judgment. Um, so, inquiry based learning is, is a more holistic learning strategy. Um, this was found in um, another of the uh, many people that researched this this um, manner of teaching. So it will increase uh, some social skills, behavioural qualities, and skills necessary for higher order thinking, which is what we're all, all after. Um, and lifelong learning is another another um, aim of the AU core and university as a whole. Um, and as Mary Francis mentioned earlier, also it's very beneficial for disadvantaged um, or um, a diverse spectrum of students. So it's not just going to be the, the people with excellent memories that can just be judged and not people who are going to excel. So you're going to be developing skills in a, a wide range of students. You can reach some of those students that maybe traditional methods aren't reaching. Um, it's me. So why haven't we been doing this all along if it's so great? <clears throat> uh, to me, in, in a sentence, it's because it's hard to do. And we can put up lots of slides and research and all of that kind of stuff, but when we get in front of a classroom, I think we all, and certainly I know, uh, resort to old habits quickly and uh, sort of under fire, we're back to the, uh, I know the answers, I love my content, I know, my, I know the answers, you do not, so my job is to basically get you the answers, and as opposed to get you to inquire about the answers, and to uh, think about it in an inquisitive kind of way, as opposed to just sitting there and, and listening. Uh, the other thing is change is difficult. And we, we chuckle about change being particularly difficult in academia, but it's difficult uh, wherever we go. And it's tough to embrace even when you know it's, it's the right thing. And there are always five different reasons why there's not enough time to do it. Uh, 
And uh, as I said at the beginning of uh, my remarks here, it's just hard to do, and it's easier to stick to the old way of doing it, uh, even though that's not the right answer. Okay, so um, what are the underlying premises of inquiry-based learning? So we we want all learning on, on the part of the learner to be part to make sense of the world. That's our kind of one of our the premise of inquiry-based learning. And um, instruction is most effective once the learner recognizes the need to learn. So once they they obviously know they need to pass their exams because they care about their GPA and their transcripts. Um, but they're here for other reasons as well. They want to have a, a rewarding future career in life. Um, like learning is most effective when learners are engaged and the problem is authentic. And I think this is probably a key thing um, in terms of when I think about in the biology department, is it an authentic um, problem that we're trying to solve or a, a, an authentic line of inquiry? Um, and does it capture the complexity of the real world? So they're going, um, their future is going to be very different to you know, our career path. So um, the, it's most effective when the learning environment enables the students to actively engage in knowledge construction and in a socially participatory way. So this is working in, um, on, the, on their own or, or in groups as well and actually participating actively, actually finding the information, doing the research, coming up with um, the information themselves, and deciding what it is that they actually really care about. Um, and that's the key to getting them to, to learn. And it's developing skills rather than just factual knowledge. OK, so what is it? So simply put, inquiry-based learning is a range of teaching approaches in which learning is stimulated by a question or an issue. So this is would lead on from an observation example. And then um, they will then develop new knowledge or un and or understanding of the topic. And the teacher is not one to <coughs> provide this knowledge or information to them. It, they're there to guide from the sidelines um, and assist them in their self-directed learning. So in other words, we want to teach students to think like whatever the discipline is that we're teaching in, like a historian, like a journalist, a biologist, or an ethicist. So um, trying to make them miniature researchers. So um, that's how I have kind of summed all this up in my head, is that uh, I want my students, and I always have wanted this, it's not like it just came to me Sunday, but I have always wanted my students to think like a historian, but too often we keep that process and uh, kind of mindset to ourselves, and we just deliver the information. When in fact, when, when you and I go to conferences, we don't go necessarily to hear usually the content, sometimes we do, um, but most of the time, I'm looking for ideas, I'm looking for the approaches, ways people are looking at this particular set of documents, or um, you know, if it's an archaeology problem, ways in which material culture can change the way historians think. So we go to conferences to get inspiration about um, approaches to our work. And it occurs to me that students, when they come to the class, they can read a book on the fall of the Roman Empire. What they want is to make sense out of all of the many different theories that there are out there. If I just give them the one that I think is the right one, which is pretty much what I've been doing all my life, then they lose out on the ability to see how knowledge is shaped. Right? And Sidney talked a lot, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, but Sidney talks a lot about in the core, our goal is to show them how the sweater is made. Right? It's to, to show them how the pieces of the sweater fit together. Right? To not hide that knowledge behind what uh, we do. So thinking like a fill in the blank is kind of my mantra for uh, how I reshaped all, all three of my classes uh, this semester, this week, um, in small ways, because I think at the end we're going to argue that for most of us the right tact is to start small, one assignment and work on it and, and integrate it into your classroom because 
in the one time that I I, that I did completely revise, uh, it worked, but it only worked because there were 17 <coughs> students, and that's not my reality most of the time. Uh, so the class size really matters, I think, and it's much more challenging when you have a class. All of my classes are 35 or 40 this semester, so you know when I sat down to think about this, I, I want to do it, I'm passionate about it, but it gets harder the larger class size. But one, so one of the things that I looked for uh, were concrete ways of doing this. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, I'll hear great ideas, but I won't have any idea how to implement it in my own narrow world. And so um, these two uh, rubrics that I'm going to show you are on your handout to take away with you, because they'll be this part of it. Uh, and this is basically the way um, most IBL researchers talk about the process. Right, that it's a cyclical process where you begin with a question, right, which is how we all work. Right? When, when, uh, when, we, when you wrote your book or your article or whatever, you started with a question. Right? So why do we not start the students off with a question? I mean, we do sometimes, but usually when I do it and have done it in the past, it's because I know that there's a particular answer I want them to get to. Inquiry-based learning suggests that there are multiple answers to get to, and that the beauty of discovery is for the students to take ownership over the things that they are most interested in. Uh, so maybe it's not the fall of the Roman Empire, although I can't imagine why you would be fascinated by that. But uh, you know, maybe it's the impacts in late antiquity of, of the expansion of Christianity. So there are many interesting questions that don't have one answer. So for me, that's what I'm looking for this semester, is to try to design this weekend uh, some assignments that don't have, I know, I'm done here. Uh, don't have one answer, they have multiple answers. And so one of the ways that you do this is you start out with a relatively open-ended question in the ask phase, and then you send them off to investigate. Now, part of what we've discovered in the history department when we do theses is that students don't know how to ask good questions. So part of my goal with them is to let them brainstorm a big question, and then over the process of the cycle, to narrow that question to something that is actually answerable with sources and you know sort of viable in historical sense. Because in my field, a lot of times they'll ask, uh, if not four questions, or you know, what if Kennedy had not been assassinated? That's not a historical question, <coughs> but I'm interested in it. It's still not a historical question. So um, for us, a lot of times you have to balance. We, we want them to be curious and to, to follow a path that they're interested in, but at the same time, it occurs to me that the success of this entire method depends on the question you ask. If you ask a bad question at the beginning, they're not going to get much out of this process. So we do spend a lot of time in uh, thesis classes in the history department formulating good questions. So I want them to start with bad questions because I want them to see how you narrow and come back to it, right? And this is the whole idea between the cycles. So they start off with a question, they'll go away, they'll do some research, I'll probably do this in groups of some sort, and they will investigate uh, what other people will stay with the fall of the Roman Empire. That's great. Um, they will go off and investigate. There's a vast literature on what, you know, the two main theories, but there's a vast literature across uh, those two main theories. They'll investigate those. Uh, and then we'll come back and we will recreate that question based on what they found because my goal is hopefully they will have asked a question that isn't quite the right question to ask. And then you come back and come down to the create. So they will create something. Uh, in my medieval survey, they're doing an anthology project where they have to own the question and uh, then their research is going to be devoted to finding four primary sources and four secondary sources that could be used uh, to answer that question, they're not actually going to answer the question. The uh, final assignment is to write an introduction to the anthology that pulls it all back together. But in that stage, they're going to create a research proposal. They'll turn it in to us, uh, my teaching assistant, and we will give them feedback. Then we'll send it back to them for revision, because I think it's really important for them to revise along the way. And then they will do peer reviewing of the revised proposal within a group setting. So that's the discuss part. Uh, then they will reflect on it, and part of the assignment is going to be to talk about the process of research <coughs> and, and what they found, where they felt that they were successful, where were they most challenged. So a lot of inquiry-based learning is about reflection too. Right? It isn't just a one-and-done-the-night-before kind of thing. You want them to think about the process 
because the goal is that this process is then replicable across you know, many courses and many, uh, if, it, if it's too quickly, if it's done too quickly, I think then it just becomes an exercise in getting the assignment done. And then you come back to, uh, after reflections, to you know, perhaps need to change your question again. I don't know exactly how that will work in practice, but in theory, you could kind of keep going around the circle until you get what you want the students to be. So this, um, I, we're not going to read these, but um, they're on your handout. This is what the uh, source that I took this from um, gives you a, a little bit more sense of what each parts of the cycle look like. And this is another useful rubric, although my husband said looking at the handout this morning, really? <laughs> Like, I don't know, people like rubrics, right? <laughs> so, but basically it's the same. Pose real questions. And again, real questions. People fight, and they fight really hard about the fall of Roman Empire. Why? I do not know. But, I mean, it's a, it's a nasty field of, and they write mean things about each other, mostly in person. Um, so it's a real question, right? I don't, I say, I'll say to them, this is a question worth pursuing because thousands of people with PhDs are pursuing this question still um, and getting jobs and writing books and stuff. So the real questions, find resources, interpret information and report findings, um, and then of course they have the, the links going. I just thought it was great, but I, I do think it has some interesting things. And you know, in the design of the assignment, I think it's worth thinking about putting these questions on the assignment, right? When you pose real questions, the goal is what do I want to know about this topic? The fall of the Roman Empire is a big topic. So do I want to know about it from the year, like really you have to start in the year, maybe 98, maybe to really do it, do it justice? No, the students will start in the fifth century because it's one semester. So you need to you know, give them some guidance in terms, but I let them choose, which is like how far back do you want to start? And so this, a lot of this comes back to the idea of taking ownership over the learning, right? That, that I'm not giving you the exact prompt, I'm giving you a broad question, and you determine what the parameters and the scope of the project will be. So, um, you can do this. If I can do it, you can do it. Uh, and it's, I think, Simple in some respects if we think about it as showing the students what we do. Now, I'm again not saying that you can never lecture again, because that's not likely or reasonable. And in fact, you do need to give them some stuff to work with, right? So, lecturing has a place in IBL. What I've discovered though is that it's more impactful in the assignments that I get, right? Instead of a, a midterm that they just regurgitate all of the stuff that I told them. And then we'll probably forget. That's even if they found for Jeopardy, they'll still forget. Um, this is something they walk away. I want it to be a, over the course of the entire semester because I want to show them that the production of knowledge takes time and it takes iteration. You have to go back and be willing to um, think, rethink the question, perhaps go down a different path, do a little bit more research. That this is how we work, right? And none of us write articles in a week, hopefully. Maybe not hopefully, I don't know. I don't. Uh, you know, it takes me a long time to, to ask the right question and find the right sources, especially if they aren't printed. And I could go somewhere, which is always fun, kind of bridge this one in. Um, but it, this is a process, and I think too often we give our students packaged information when in fact we know that it's hard to come by this information. Right? This takes a lot of sweat to write articles and write books. So that's what uh, thinking like a the fill in the blank, if you like a historian, <coughs> developing the kinds of habits of mind that historians have, or journalists, or biologists. Uh, and then in this sense, it mirrors our professional practice. And what is easier to teach, really, than what we do all the time, and then what we were trained to do. Because I don't know about you, the one thing I was not trained to do was teach. I was trained to write like a historian, but I was not trained how to teach. I was a teaching assistant, I paid attention, but my teaching methods are based on you know, my, I took the best from what I thought were the best techniques of all of the people I TA for. And we had a, you know, a one-day colloquium 
once a year or something, but that's not effective pedagogical instruction, in my view. It's just the way things are. So what we, I think we need to do is teach them how to do what we do best. So at this point, I want to talk about uh, some examples. So I'm just going to briefly introduce that I'm not a philosopher, but I thought this was an interesting example. And then Sarah and Bob are going to talk about theirs. If we have time, I'll come back to my anthology, but I kind of already told you about it, so I think you won't worry about it. The dilemma for inquiry-based learning is that it can take so many different forms. I mean, there are a bewildering number of, of kind of techniques. I think the ask cycle is actually a good thing to keep in mind as you're designing assignments, but there are all kinds of ways in which people become active learners. And one of them is role playing, which I don't do too much in my classes, but um, I'm certainly more interested than I was before. And this is a, a philosophy course where they, um, they pair me groups, and, and the research is clear, there must be a social aspect to inquiry-based learning. You know, we, we go to conferences, that's our social role. We send our drafts to our friends, you know, to peers and whatnot. So we have a social world in which we work. Uh, so that's key. You don't ever want to have them doing this work off in isolation. Otherwise, they might as well just be writing a research, you know, it's kind of standard research paper. But in this particular assignment, um, the class itself is framed around, I think it was an intro philosophy class, is framed around what can you know, what are you, what can you do, uh, what should you do? These are not historical questions, so I'm a little bit outside my head here, but uh, they, they pair students up and they all choose a philosopher to become. Uh, and they were given a short list of resources to start with, which is probably a good idea. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the last few days putting together uh, places for, uh, in my anthology assignment, places for them to start. I don't want them, and I tell them they have to find other stuff, but there's a place to start. Then they investigate, uh, they meet together, they discuss the resources, the ideas of the philosopher, uh, and in particular, the goal is to be able to answer all of those four questions uh, that are the sort of premise of the course uh, from the perspective of the philosopher. And then the teams develop presentations as if they were the philosopher. This sounds like fun. I, I have to figure out a way to do this. Uh, in the last two weeks of the term, they present. Again, that's a non-starter with a class of 40 students. Even if you break them up in groups of five, you're still talking eight presentations, which is hard to give up that time. But still, um, they give the uh, presentation, then the students are graded in the class on how well they interact with the presentation, the questions that they ask and the feedback that they give to the student, the other students. And then the, each team member writes a paper, so there's an individual component to this, which I think is also important, assessing the view of the philosopher on one of the four questions, because four would probably be too many. Uh, and then there was also some element of, uh, I think we all can agree that when you put students in groups, there's always like the alpha group member, and then there's like a couple of alpha group members, and then there are a couple of kids who just sort of sit there. Uh, so um, it, it's, the literature seems clear that you have to have some sort of um, assessment for group activity, and I have to do more research on that because I've never felt very comfortable asking students to rat on each other, but it does seem to be uh, an element to success here. So that's the philosophy <coughs> example. Turn it over Sarah for that. Okay, so um, we have a bit of an advantage in biology is because we have labs, so we have a bit more time. Um, so um, I wanted just to talk about an example of something that we do in an introductory biology class. It's in a lab. It's actually in a major's class, but I feel like it could be transferred to um, a, a non-major's class. So in um, this is a four-week project, but it actually happens later later on in the semester, so the students have had a grounding, these are still freshmen, but they've had a grounding of, um, what is it, bacteria, or they've given some, been given some tools, and then they can choose from those tools what they want to, um, what kind of questions they can ask using those tools, those skills that they've <coughs> developed in the previous sort of half the semester. So, they are asked to ask a, a scientific question um, based on, make an observation, then ask the scientific question, um, and they would do a little bit of research before, uh, while they're developing this question, and then with the guidance of the um, instructor, help them to ask those good questions. So it's all, help them to, to, to get a question that can be 
that you can make progress on in four weeks. Um, so these are uh, group small group projects, so two or three students in a group. Um, so once the question has been asked, we then run around trying to find all the things that they, <coughs> they want <coughs> to test or to use. Or, you know, if, does the bacteria grow better in the presence of caffeine or something like that? Um, and, and then they do their lab experiment and they make a lot of mistakes and they hopefully get some kind of results and some data. <coughs> And then they are able to then use that statistical uh, knowledge that they've hopefully uh, gained already. Um, so this is this is great for uh, learning how to be a research scientist. So you learn how to. They've already had a, a session on using the library or finding relevant um, authoritative sources from the, the um, science librarian. So they can use those skills um, and. Develop lab skills, group working skills, um, and then they will give a group presentation. So we have 15 students in a, in a lab, so we are able to do everyone sits with everyone else's group presentation. So we can do that in one lab session. So um, this is pretty daunting for the students actually to be in control. They get very nervous, like, well, what is the answer? Like, well, what, what should it be? Like, you know, they just feel a bit uncomfortable. <coughs> doing something that we don't know the answer to. So that can be something that is very um, uncomfortable for them, but um, they have a lot more ownership in their work because they ask the question. They show something that they were interested in, in the beginning, so um, it really, they're more motivated. They come in outside class times to come and check on their bacteria and you know analyze data and it would be crazy. It would be amazing. Um, and then they have to reflect on how, how did their design of their experiment go? How did their group work together? What would they do differently? And that's just the real sort of scientific method. That's what you would do if you were um, in paper. Um, so that's what we do in the biology department. And as I said, it's in a, in a lab setting. Um, but I think that those couldn't be transferred to a, um, a core class. And I'm, I'm going to invite Mira and kind of, kind of Finalise my assignments this weekend for my complex problem class, which is not a lab paper class, but it's a, a, a biology topic class on genetic modification. And I'm going to try and set an assignment to be um, inquiry based learning. Um, I'll see how that goes. So, um, Bob is going to talk a little bit about his. Experience in uh, transforming the class. I have a confession to make. Two, two confessions. The first is I've already taught a complex problem class, and my own assessment is I didn't do great. Uh, my second confession is while I started out as Harry Potter, I dreamt that I was Harry Potter. <laughs> I, in fact, kept waking up realizing that I am Ms. Umbridge. <laughs> and watching her on the screen was, gave me frightening memories. In fact. Uh, I did, as, as I reflected during winter break about things I did right, things that I did wrong, there were things that, in fact, I did right, such as, and I teach decision making. That's my, my subject matter. Uh, and I'm an expert, and you are not. <laughs> you see the problem? Okay. Um, so one of the things that I did that, that ended up being a great assignment um, was I had them look at Kennedy's core, two of Kennedy's core decisions. One was the pay, Bay of Pigs decision, which ended up, of course, being a fiasco. And the second was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And to kind of unpack those two decision-making processes and um, try to figure out why one went so poorly and the other went fairly, fairly well. Uh, great potential assignment executed not so well. And part of the reason was rather than facilitate their understanding of those decisions, 
I kept jamming the right and wrong answers down their throats uh, as to why they were the right uh, answers derived from my, my content, which of course I know is right, and, uh, and theirs is not. So, so it was, I, I found execution to be difficult. The other thing I found, which Sarah mentioned, a bit, um, I, I didn't find a lot of my students in my class that were anxiously awaiting for this stuff. Uh, they weren't like Harry Potter's followers. Uh, I found a lot of students that basically had the attitude of, clearly define for me what you want. Let me give it to you so that I can get an A. And let's go home. And that's very <coughs> problematic when you're trying to do inquiry-based uh, learning. Um, because the process, the evaluation process, I found I struggled with and kept coming back to doing evaluation against my content rather than against their inquiry-based learning process. Uh, and when I couldn't find a lot of very popular <coughs> followers in my class, that caused me even more to kind of sink back to being uh, Ms. Umbridge. Um, and in fact, as that happens, I would say that one of my lessons learned for the spring semester and one lesson I would share with you is you need to be steadfast in your commitment to inquiry-based learning. Because it isn't easy. It's not going to be easy for you. And I, I don't think that you're going to find, at least initially, a lot of folks out there just thirsting for this. Because they really are going to be looking for the other. They're going to be looking for the clear assignment. Tell me what you want me to know. Uh, tell me what I have to learn to get an A. And let's get about that business and not worry about this inquiry-based learning stuff. So uh, that's my confession. I hope sharing it uh, will help you a little bit. Uh, because again, as I've said before, I'll, I'll repeat myself. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and that is a piece that we really hadn't talked about before. Is and a lot of the research is based on faculty resistance, but student resistance is huge too. Um, they they really, you know, to me it's so exciting. I love the thing, but but for a lot of them it's really scary because they you know they're already very uh, anxious. So now you're telling them there's no clear answer. Um, and, it, and wrapped up in all of this is good assessment, and that's hard to do too. I think for me, um, when I do my teach thesis in the history department, a lot of times the grade they get, even if they wrote a bad thesis, but if, if I feel like they learned, you know, they, they started here and they ended up here, even though here is still pretty bad, you know, I try to think about the holistic view of that. Uh, but it is hard. There's no, I and mean, there is research, right? So one of the things that, um, one of the things we'll, We'll circle back to in a second. Is that all you have to do is you know Google. There is so much research on inquiry based learning that you could spend months going down this rabbit hole. So maybe it's a summer project, but um, you know it really is. You can find answers to how to design assessments that will actually help people. But it is the case, and the literature is very clear that students will sometimes revolt, which is why you need to. If you're going to do this in any big way in class, that's the course you designate as your um, evaluation, you know, at least in formal terms. I would still, of course, give them my own evaluations, but um, because none of us, most of us, can't take that hit when the students say, this is not what I expected. It's the one time, I, I don't know if you guys, a lot of you were here a few years ago when we had the flipped classroom uh, presentation at lunch. So I went home over the weekend and I flipped one of my classrooms and the students hated it. <laughs> they hated it. They said to me, I come to the history department to hear good stories. And you tell really good stories. Why aren't you telling good stories this semester? So um, that was a really important lesson for me that um, you know I can't just jump into things. I have to think about them harder and, and uh, have 
and, and again, have better conversations with the students about why this matters. Like, why are we doing this? And don't just say, we're doing this totally different. You're going to be completely uncomfortable and anxious all semester. You know, so, you know, what, what, what are the, what's the rationale behind it? Kind of stuff. But so, yeah, let's do the, let's open it up here. Uh, I just wanted to comment on something, try to tie something together here. I believe that when you first started, you mentioned that you are the content subject matter expert, but when it came to te teaching methodology and strategy for instruction, that was not your strong suit. And I think that when I'm listening to, to, the, to, the, uh, to what you're saying, I'm connecting a lot of uh, aspects to the idea that you're presenting here. For example, uh, a triggering event, that, that transformative part to the inquiry-based learning, which perhaps at the end result, like you said in the beginning, you were going to recheck the ask question. Hopefully that they hadn't set it up right, so then they, they would have what Meta referred to in transformational learning as a disorientating dilemma. And so I think what's important too is that when folks sitting here listen, if you're a teaching assistant or a someone who does not have the strength in teaching methodology, that you take a look at other theories and methods that do come into the idea, and I think the transformative learning is, is really one to get into. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Wait. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Um, I work here at the Health Promotion and Advocacy Center, so I'm not in a faculty role, but I am in a, in a large part teaching role. Um, I would love to hear more. I know we mentioned it pretty briefly in terms of like inclusion, diversity, equity, all these kind of buzzwords that are coming up, especially at our school now. And um, do you have any specific things that have worked really well for you when you're working with students of especially marginalized identities, um, how we take that into account, especially I think about um, just access to certain kinds of resources before coming to college and also understanding that in certain areas, like I know for me personally, sometimes like thinking outside the box has gotten me in trouble in school. So a lot of that has been taught out of me to just kind of follow the rules. And like just in history, sometimes that thinking out of the box has gotten me killed or has gotten you severely marginalized, you know? So I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. So is your question more about how do you, about the comfort level, or? I guess it's more about like, how are you embodying those things, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion through this process, um, understanding the historical kind of context of that, and also that sometimes like I hear those words, but I don't see tangibly what you're, what is happening to embody it. We just kind of say it in the past, in passing. Right, okay. Um, so yeah, so that was one of my points of starting with the core mission statement, because I love the core mission statement, but you know, it, it, it is a big, chunky thing where we say we're gonna do a lot of things, and you know, it's, when you look at the different parts, it gets more complicated. So I don't have a great answer for you, other than to say that the research shows that when you focus on inquiry-based learning, you empower students in a personal way that you do not otherwise. So for example, I was in teaching a British history class last semester, and you know, I would, I would be going great guns on Richard III, and I'd look out there, and there would be parts of the class who are furiously writing notes. And then there are other parts of the class that are just sort of staring at me. And then there are other parts of the class who are you know, maybe sleeping or something, but it occurred to me, and so occasionally I will stop and say to them, why aren't you taking notes? Like to me, that's like kind of basic, right? But then I realized that what if you don't come from a note-taking place? Like what if your background, you never learned how to, because it is a skill, right? If you, we've all looked at students' notes before, and, and it, that's what you thought was important, and that's what you chose to write down of all the wonderful things I said. So um, it, it occurs to me that this is really important, because it, the test scores in that particular class lined up, unfortunately, with the way I, one might think that would happen. So um, that's why I realized that this is a key piece of this. If we really care about diversity and inclusion and equality in education, we can't just teach the way prep school kids learn. Right? We have to teach the way lots of people learn. Um, so I'm still personally wrestling with that in terms of how to actually do it, but I think a project, and a, and a project that involves group work, 
is part of the answer to that. That's helpful. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think uh, about those things that I did right that worked well. There were in fact group work, um, and by its nature, group work tends to be inclusive, and uh, it tends to give it makes it safe for people who are uh, otherwise uh, not willing. Uh, or not able for some reason to raise their hand, don't have that outgoing personality, whatever it might be, uh, to raise their hand, it makes it safer and easier for them to participate and be a part of the learning process if it's done in groups versus if it's done individual and you're being Ms. Umbridge, I would say. I uh, wasn't, uh, I, it occurred to me as I heard you talk, each of you, about your own personal resistance and the resistance you find among your students. Uh, the first time you introduced this methodology, it, it reminds me of the concept of muscle memory. When we all do a new physical exercise or a new pose in yoga, uh, the first time feels really strange, and the second time it it's much easier, and the third time much, much easier. So this brings me to the question of, is there a way a faculty member could introduce IBL in a course in a small way at the beginning, and another time later, and a third time uh, again in the same course, so that you and the students become more comfortable with the methodology and the approach, and uh, continue to learn through that kind of investigative uh, methodology. I like what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> is there time? Yeah. Is the question. I, think, I think there is time. And I think, again, I, I really struggle with this because I spent 25 years lecturing. So part of me doesn't want to give up all the intellectual energy and time and you know whatnot that I put into those beautiful lectures. Um, so, you know, when, you, when, you sit, when I sit down and I look at it, because I teach a lot of survey courses, a thousand years of medieval history, what, I mean, what do I give up? I've already given up all the fun stuff. Right? Just, so it is really challenging. That's why I think um, in the last slide, my husband thought this was the stupidest thing ever. But anyway, I say start small and scaffold on. Because what do you mean scaffold on? You haven't even talked about scaffolding. But scaffolding is part of it, right? I mean, and I think that's one of the things that you start small and you gradually scaffold assignments so you get to the end where a student looks at the end and I, I, I see this a lot with thesis writers at the beginning of the semester they're, they're freaked out they, they cannot possibly do this and then we have a big party at the end because they did a great job right so they, what they think they can do at the beginning is daunting or what they think they cannot do is daunting uh, but we take it in small chunks so I think we just do the same thing with with um, inquiry based learning is for our comfort level and to kind of ease into it Right? And just like this, but I think you're right about the muscle memory. I like that. And and you might reward yourself and the students with those wonderful stories in between these investigations. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. The stories don't have to be the meat. They can be the dessert. I like it. The other thing I would I would jump in is that perhaps a little unlike muscle memory, uh, I would suggest to that some of the things you will try will fail. Uh, and, and so it's a little, the scaffolding metaphor is a terrific one, I think, but it has its limitations. Uh, and you just have to stay the course. You have to stay the course. Hi, so my name is Amy Trey, I'm from the Department of Health Studies. And earlier you mentioned that this whole process really hinges on having a good question. And so I, I think as the, as the instructor, you're starting with this sort of this leading broader question. So my question for you is, how do you know when you have a good question? Do you, is it, do you have to go through the entire process to figure that out? Or are there some ways to identify a good question right off the bat? Um, I think the way I was thinking about a good question wasn't the instructor thinking of a good question, it was the student thinking of the question. 
And I think the way that I would approach that is then brainstorm as a group and maybe spend a whole class thinking of the question and doing some preliminary research and then vetting it, basically, bringing it to the instructor and then deciding or trying to help them to hone that question. I think that's the way I thought about it. Um, yeah, because it is difficult. I mean, again, it's the same type of what I question that I always get for thesis writers. And the, what I say to them at the beginning is, I don't care what you do, just ask me to Google. It just sounds kind of dumb, but it's actually, you know, you have to have primary sources. It, it can't be something that everybody's wondered about, but nobody can research because there aren't any sources. Um, but we, and thesis is an interesting way to think about it because capstone is the ultimate ideal. And it's interesting because most of us have capstones. If you don't already, you will uh, for the core. And so what I, what I found ironic in some ways is that we leave all of the good stuff of learning to the very last, right? So in the history department, most of the people who use thesis are seniors, and they have no idea what to do. Like, what are we doing wrong then? That they don't know how to do increase-based learning at all until they get to the prime year of the major. So we spent, uh, like Sarah suggested, the first couple of weeks honing the question, right? Start broad and you know, working around it, say, I really want to do this, I'll, and I'll give them the, the rope, say, <laughs> go to the library, bring me back some primary sources, they'll come back and say, you were right, there are no primary sources. Like, good, move on, let's move on. You know what I mean? So it, it is, it's tempting, I mean, because I could give them good questions easily, right? But it's tempting to do that, but you have to, like Bob said, you have to stay the course and let them make mistakes. And that's hard to watch because you know they're uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable with their discomfort and you know it's going to show up in your evaluation. So it, it is a hard process to watch, but the joy I see in thesis writers at the end is incomparable. Like we have History Day, which we have a celebration of undergraduate research at the end of the year. And it is the most joyful experience. It's why I do what I do. And they did it all. But you know, those are the classes I remember. I don't remember survey British history, because I, I force them to memorize tons of information. But yes, it's, a, it's an iterative process. Hi, my name is Cindy. Um, uh, what she keeps talking about, that most of you don't know. So, um, uh -oh. uh, I have a quick question for you, or actually for audience members as well. I think part of when you're trying to do this work, the first two or three weeks of the semester are really important in terms of setting a tone, sort of getting buy-in from all the students on the idea that we're, we're going to ask questions together, we're going to struggle together, we're going to reflect together. So I was wondering if you all have some strategies for things you might do in the first couple of weeks of the semester for sort of building that community buy-in, or if other folks who've tried certain similar things have done um, in the first couple of weeks to sort of get the tone set, because I think if everybody sort of agrees that we're going to learn together, then um, yeah, you're much less likely to, well, you at least have a safety net on these people when you do when you fall off and everything. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, in the lab science, it's probably a little bit easier to get by in because they know that this is what scientists do and therefore they're willing to do that. I think it's harder in like a history class because again, they, they say, I just want to hear my story. Does anybody else have? Who's tried inquiry based learning out there? Have any suggestions for? I think you're absolutely right. Get the students on your side. I have a suggestion. My dissertation was very related to this. We are from the same view. I've been away from teaching, came back, new generation and all. What I have done, I tell them I'm continuing to this day. If you ask any question, it's a good question, any answer is a good answer. So I Throw the question, what did you say? <laughs> and then they say, no, that I'm not And then after two to three weeks, I say everybody's talking loud. That's more. interesting. I like that. What did he say? So uh, he sort of pretends to be deaf. I'm not, you know what I mean. But, so get the students to, to say their questions louder and participate louder because you know, they, you ask them the question, they're all like, so yeah, I like that idea. But so much of teaching though is performance, and I think I can see how you would be good at this. It would be harder for me to do that. I'm so self-conscious in the classroom, but these kinds of techniques are really useful. Hi, I'm Rebecca Hazen. I'm also from biology. Um, 
So uh, one of the things that's worked well for me, kind of on that idea of central teaching and performing, I think is also kind of getting the students to understand that they are to perform as well. And um, one of the things that helps me a lot, it's from a, a book I read one time, um, it was just the first thing, first day, setting that um, kind of student-centered idea right from the beginning. The first thing you do is not, here's who I am, let me tell you about me kind of thing as your professor, but immediately turn the attention straight to the student so that from the get-go, that is the um, environment in the classroom. And then kind of um, inquiry-based learning can be not only these big ideas that we're talking about, with like the big questions that they investigate, but you can also kind of pepper um, questions throughout your lecturing even, you know, just by creating a slide before a slide with a bunch of information where you get them, you ask them the question first and make them talk about it before you're like, and here's the stuff I know. Um, so those are some of the ideas that have worked for me. And I totally agree with this idea also of like, oh, I'm sorry, that's a great idea. I can't hear you. Say it a little louder. Um, that was also a wonderful idea. Do you have them? Um, do you have them introduce themselves? I do. I, I do. Um, <laughs> one of the kind of icebreakers I do at the beginning of class for some of my lab sessions is to um, they make little name tags for themselves, and we, I use those for the first couple of weeks so that we can create a collegial atmosphere in the classroom. And I have them also um, create a bat symbol for themselves. Um, that is, you know, how like Batman will put up the bat symbol when he's in in need of something to signify that he's there. Um, but uh, they create their own little symbol and they tell their colleagues why that symbolizes them. Um, so, yeah. Thanks very much. I know we only have a couple minutes left. I just wanted to know if, um, in your experience, it helps to set expectations with language in the syllabus. Um, and if so, do you actually use the term inquiry-based learning, or is that something that's mostly affected on theoretical academic circles? I took a class in college that was taught by the Socratic method, and it was exciting to learn that's what we were doing. But this is a little bit, I think. I think we do. I, I'll, I'll, I'll confess, I, I certainly put that language on my core syllabi. Um, I'm not sure it's on my syllabus with the anthology project, and it should be. So the answer is yes, it should be. Um, I think because again, if we're going to if we're going to do it and exhibit, you know, and sort of show how the sweater is made, then we should. It's, it's worth showing them that there's reason that, that we're doing this for a reason, right? That it's not just. I woke up one day and had this great idea. Um, and I was interested to learn that a lot of this is actually quite old. Right? It's based on Piaget and uh, a lot of other people I'd heard of, but as a historian, I sort of went and glancing. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I, I think we should. Um, but I think we have to on core syllabi, but not, I think it's, it's a little bit more individual than the rest. But I will. So, Patrick Jackson. Um, the, uh, my favorite buy-in activity to set the tone for the beginning of the semester is asking the students how they want to address whatever the particular short piece of reading is that you've given them for the first day. You have them do something that's like, you know, give them a two-page something or other. All right, we're going to discuss this now. How do you want to do this? And then it's going to take most of the rest of the class for them to argue about how they want to do this. And then you get to the end, and you spend the last two minutes saying, okay, schematically, here are the different ways of looking at things that we've talked about in the course of the class. And over the next several weeks, we're going to end up exploring a bunch of these things in detail. turns out that the punchline for the day wasn't the reading. The punchline for the day was the discussion about the reading. And they go, oh, wow, wait a minute. There's different ways to approach stuff. And this goes back, reflecting back to something I said earlier about the role of lecturing. One way students learn is by listening to an expert explain something. That's not the only way students learn. But if you put that in as one option among others, you say, we're going to do different things over the course of the semester, and you can reflect on which ones work for you and which ones don't. But setting that tone at the beginning where it's kind of like, oh, we get to figure this out. And of course, a lot of the ways they come up with or how they're going to address things are going to be kind of silly. Of course they are, but you can work with that. 
Because then you say, all right, we'll give it a try. And then they try to say, well, that didn't really work. Huh, what did we learn? Okay, we learned that radical democracy of everybody's interpretation of the text is exactly the same. is probably not the best way to go about to doing it. We learned something. Good. Let's move on. Right? So it's that kind of working with having that do that sort of initial discussion, which can be scary, but pays off. I think that also links with what uh, what Cindy was saying, which was start early. And you, you talked about starting the first day. And I look back now, one of the things that I didn't do was I, I waited until like week four. I was throwing content after content at them uh, for three or four weeks before we got to the first exercise. But while the first exercise was not a bad one, by that time, I had already lost that opportunity to set the tone. Thank you again. This has really turned into true confession. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of us learn, like, you know, it, the irony, of course, is this is what we are asking our students to do. And sorry, it's to learn by failure. Right? Most of us learn by doing something wrong. Hopefully not. This is why I'm not a brain surgeon. <laughs> I guess we're out of time, so thank you all for coming. And